Thank you, Ruben. Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters, and good morning to uh, those on GoToMeeting. Um, unfortunately, I've been uh, forgetting to press record on GoToMeeting previously. So um, our last two sessions, I don't think, have been recorded, um, which is a bit of a shame because I've uh, had a few people already ask about them. But we've managed to record this one. Um, so what we've been looking at is the subject of uh, the formation of man as recorded in the, in the record of Genesis. And we looked in our first uh, study uh, at the focus of Genesis 1 verse 26 of the purpose of God in the formation of man. That God created man as the centerpiece of his creation, the head of his creation, in order to have dominion over the affairs of his creation, which included the title deeds to an inheritance, a piece of land that he gave him, and also to have dominion over the animals. And what we saw is that man, through disobedience to simple commands that God had given, went through a series of evictions from the land. And, and continuously, God was evicting um, those followers that he had called out of the land. But he wasn't done with them. And God is the great creator. He is creating a masterpiece out of humankind. And in our second study, we looked at the resources that God used. And we looked at how it was done in Genesis chapter 2. That God would take the lowest form of resource that was there, dirt. And even though the record in Genesis chapter 2 says there was gold in that land, and there was bedellium, and there was onyx, there was precious resources. And he could have taken man from an uncut diamond. Instead, he took man from dirt. And he was going to, from dirt, form mankind. Because the glory always has to be with God. And when you consider the work of the master potter, and you consider what a, uh, a craftsman might make. You know, you can make a simple vessel like, like a bowl and they throw a lump of clay on a wheel and then they might put water on it and then they slowly spin it round and round and round and round until finally it starts taking shape. Or a master craftsman can take a lump of clay and he uses all sorts of tools. Tools like this here. Um, tools which include things that poke and prod. Things like scalpels which cut deep into the clay to remove the impurities out of the clay. And God, in dealing with man, spent 4,000 years striving with mankind. And the symbol of Jacob wrestling the angel was the symbol of God dealing with mankind. And that there were some forms of clay that God could work with. But there was not a man that was completely pliable. There was not a man ever that was completely adaptable and moldable in the hand of the master potter. And continuously, the clay would strive with the potter. Why are you making me thus? Why do you try to put a handle on me? Why do you poke and prod? It hurts. Stop it. A man continuously fights and wrestles with God. Until, of course, the birth of his son. And that's our focus, isn't he? Isn't it? We come to look at he who was the express image 
of his, fa of his father. He was found in fashion as a man and he was made in the direct image of his father. But in order to do so, he wasn't naturally. He didn't just come out of the womb and naturally become this masterpiece in, a, in an instant. He developed, didn't he? And he was beautiful in the hands of the potter. He was perfect clay in his father's hands because he was full of moisture, wasn't he? He was the word made flesh. He was the living water. And so within his life, he was, as he said himself, the wellspring of life. Behold my servant, in whom I have chosen, my spirit in whom I delight, I will put my spirit upon him. And the spirit of God was pulled upon him in abundance, without measure. And he was pliable in the hands of the father. And he was soft, wasn't he? Ever so gentle. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and learn of me. Learn of me, for I am gentle. I am lowly in spirit, Jesus said. Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 42 of this servant, a bruised reed, he won't break. You know, there was God's creation. Adam was given control over the land. And here's a picture in Isaiah of the most fragile piece of plant in God's land. A reed in amongst thousands and thousands of reeds or wheat. And you've got a little broken stem. And there's Jesus in this symbol as a servant who, I'm not going to just break that stem off. I'm going to do whatever it takes to nurture that back to life. And how many bruised reeds? are here in this hall. How many have been broken and healed by the gentleness of this man? He was soft. And he was compliant. See, the beauty of that clay was so soft and moldable, it was almost as though he knew what the master was creating and was compliant to the will of the master potter. And so when it came to the time when he was going to fulfill his father's will, he gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Had that ever been seen before? Can you imagine that Roman soldier as he picked up that Roman flagellum, that whip that was impregnated with bone and metal designed to tear the skin off her back? And as he raised that whip, this man, as though he lifted his back to meet the whip. So compliant was he to the Father's will. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. He endured and learned obedience to the ultimate point, wasn't it? I delight to do thy will, O Lord. Isaiah chapter 40. I delight to do thy will. Morning by morning you waken me, he says. My ear is open. So obedient was he to the Father's will. I delight to do thy will. And there in the garden, that's the example, wasn't it? Of the son compliant to the master potter. Imagine that. There was the greatest battle that was ever fought in that garden. And there were two wills. But he wasn't going to resist. 
He struggled and struggled and struggled with what lay ahead. But when the time came when he rose out, out of that garden, he was determined to do his father's will. And he knew what his father's will was. And of course, because of that, because of that, all creation is restored to harmony. And Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the servant, the rod out of the stem of Jesse that shall grow up, a branch shall grow out of his roots, and I'll put my spirit within him. And then it goes on to say of all the beauty of creation that is restored because of the obedience of this little child. And so you've got this picture of the little child, of course, putting his hand on a on the hand of a, of a serpent. That's Eden restored, isn't it? That's the balance being put back. That's creation the way it should be. The man who is given dominion and they will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain because of the little child. And what about us? Well, God found a perfect mold, didn't he? He found a perfect piece of clay. That was his perfect image. And he's going to use that bit of clay to make a mold. And that mold is going to be what he's going to use to fashion you and I into that mold. We are built in the image of the invisible. We haven't seen him, have we? That's what he said to Thomas. Blessed Thomas are those who have not seen me yet believed. 2,000 years later, we see him. We see the invisible. We've come to see his face, haven't we? And we're being molded and we're being fashioned by the Father into that image right now. Because we're all taken from the same lump of clay. We're all molded out of one clump. It's him. God's the master potter and he's going to take that lump because he found perfect clay. He found perfect moldable clay in his son. And he says, I'm going to use that resource. That's the resource I'm going to use to build my new creation, a multitude, my new Adam and Eve out of that piece of clay, out of that lump. No wonder it says, let this mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. We are built in Christ. And as it says in Colossians chapter 3 that we look on, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Being born after the image of its creator. And when we look at the example of Jesus and you, and you think what he had to endure, what he had to go through, the humbling process he went through. And, and it's challenging, isn't it? Because you sort of think, why did Jesus have to suffer? Why did he have to endure such a trial? Why did he have to go through such? It's one thing to know that Jesus had to die, but why did he have to die such a brutal death? Why did he have to endure such a horrific death? It was love. Not just the love of the son compliant with the father, it was the love of the father. Because God had been dealing with clay for 4,000 years that was non compliant. And there were so many vessels and there were so many pots that are strewn out along the valley, broken because they were useless and he couldn't use them. And he wanted to make beautiful creatures and in order to do that he had to find clay that was compliant and the reason jesus had to endure such a brutal horrific death is because that event transcends time and geography 
Here we are 2,000 years later, and that event still stops you and me in our tracks. And it doesn't matter what nationality we are from, it doesn't matter what language we are from, when we come face to face with that event, with the horrific nature of that event of Jesus at the cross, we see a man who willingly gave himself to his father's will. It stops us. It humbles us. It breaks us. It changes us, or at least it should. And when it does, we have this incredible thing we are now, we are a new creation. We are now molded and fashioned into this image of Jesus because we look at him and we see his character and his relationship to the Father and we want to emulate that. And Corinthians says, we all are beholding with unveiled face the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into that same image. This is the molding that's growing, going on. And, and the analogy that's here is taken from, of course, the story of Moses, who went up and saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of God and his face shone. But he was told to put a veil on his face to hide that glory. Why did he have to hide the glory of God? It's because no man has been able to manifest the glory of God in true humility. No man. Moses was the meekest man, the most humble man. But even Moses couldn't fully manifest the glory of the power of God with true humility. This unveiled face we have is that God wants us now to present Jesus to the world, to declare Jesus, to unveil the face, to show the glory everywhere we go so that people might say, he's been with Jesus, he's been with Jesus, she's been with Jesus. And they know that because of our humility, because we've been fashioned and molded into a man who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, who thought equality with God something not to be grasped at like Eve, but took on himself the form of a servant. And even though he was in fashion as God, the express image, he became the lowest of the low. And when we take that image, now we can manifest God's glory. Now we can show the world. Now God says you are in the image and the likeness of God. See, when God designed man right at the beginning in Genesis 1 verse 26, he said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. And then in Genesis chapter 5, it says he made man in his image. And it doesn't say in his likeness. It was his intention always to make man in his image and likeness. And Corinthians picks it up in 1 Corinthians 11, says man is made in the image and the glory of God. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And look who God chooses to do that. You know, it's not our it's not our work, is it? You know, if it was man's work, when you look at the workmanship of man, uh, that, that's Pablo Picasso. You know, Pablo Picasso is one of the most famous paintings ever. And sometimes I feel that's kind of what where I'm at in terms of you know God's creative work with me. It's a work in progress, got a lot to go. But you know, that's the thing with the master craftsman, is there's an incredible amount of diversity, isn't there, in working with clay and pots. An amazing amount of diversity. None of us are, are, are the same. And that's the beauty of it. But we're all taken from that same lump of clay now. And God can use and make us into incredible vessels for his service. But we're all a work in progress, aren't we? 
And we're all diverse. And we're all different. And it's no good looking at somebody else and saying, you know, I wish they were like this. I wish they'd change. And it's not our work, is it? Because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, we're his workmanship. If it was our workmanship, we'd end up like a Picasso, wouldn't we? That would, that would be pretty much the end result. I, I tell you what, I'm not really that arty, but if, I, if, if, if this was our work, if I was trying to change me into something better, and so it's about accepting that this is the workmanship of God. And you know what? He who has begun this work in us, in the day he called us, he's going to finish it. It's his workmanship. He's not going to fail because he can take dirt and make diamonds. It starts with dirt in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, doesn't it? He starts with taking people from dirt. And when you come to Revelation chapter 21 and you see the incredible, glorious temple of New Jerusalem, it says in that city, verse 18, the wall was built out of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass and the foundations of the city were adorned with every type of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third Agar, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Beautiful, beautiful diamonds and gems and glorious stones are making up this new Jerusalem. Because God can take dirt. And he can make gems, the most precious things. And the way he's done that is through a perfect piece of clay. We're here to remember Jesus, who is fashioned into that glorious image. And we are fashioned upon his image.